All right, Pete, how's it going? Uh, it's really good to, I, I feel like I'm on like a TV show, so it's really great to be back here in Toronto. True story, for those of you who don't know, I don't know how many people know my story, but uh, I actually, first time I ever presented at a word camp was in 2008, and it was in Toronto, and it was at Centennial College. I think it was the first Toronto word camp ever. And uh, at the time, I was living here, and I was a professor at Seneca College, and I taught the first ever WordPress. In fact, it was the first time WordPress had ever been taught officially in any college or university in Canada. And we had a course at Seneca, and I brought all my students, and we all went to Centennial. It was kind of funny. Different college was actually running the WordCamp. Long story short, following year, I became the organizer. My students and I, we organized WordCamp Toronto 2009. And then about a month after that WordCamp, which was a very successful one, I moved to Montreal, back to where my family's from. And uh, now I'm still there. And then I was an organizer in Montreal for three years. Anyway, so I've been doing the WordPress thing for a very, very long time. Um, and it's really cool to be back here to be speaking at WordCamp Toronto again, because I haven't done it in uh, years. Actually, no, I think I spoke at George Brown a couple years ago. So that was the last time uh, I spoke at a WordCamp in Toronto. So this presentation is going to be a little different. I know the, the uh, description says that it's not a marketing presentation on how to get more conversions. And that's true. It's not a marketing presentation on how to get more conversions. But we are definitely going to discuss what A-B testing is, how A-B testing works, and how those basic fundamentals can be applied to building WordPress blogs, websites, magazines, actually anything you do in general, anything you put online can be A-B tested. Anything can be designed to get better conversions. Colors, placement, copy, all of that kind of stuff. I ran a marketing agency in Montreal for three or four years. And uh, we did mostly digital marketing, but one of the big things you know, we always ended up having to do for clients were landing pages, online campaigns. This became a really big thing for us, and we were partnered with Unbounce. Anyone, everyone in this room familiar? First of all, does everyone in here know what a landing page is? Yeah. You can stick your hands up. We can stretch a little. It's all good. Stretch. Yeah, great. Everybody knows what A-B testing is? If you don't, it's okay too. Cool. Uh, everyone knows what Unbounce is? No? Okay, cool. So Unbounce is actually a, uh, essentially a DIY uh, landing page creation tool. It's all front end, drag and drop. You don't really need to code. Super cool. Actually, Canadian startup out of Vancouver, they pretty much, they pretty much invented the industry for what it is now. There's many, many different tools and software out there. Instapage, Lander, Optimizely. I mean, HubSpot does it, Marketo, Kissmetrics. You know, I could go on and on and on, plus all the tools we'll talk about today in WordPress that do it as well. Uh, but Unbounce was kind of the first company to ever say, hey, we have a tool for, for marketers, for business owners, for whoever needs to create landing pages on the fly. So it allows you to track, A-B test, multivariant test, and it has a ton of great integrations. And recently they just launched a really awesome uh, Unbounce plus WordPress integration as well. So what I want to do is kind of go through the basics here of like what <coughs> A-B testing is. So before we can start testing, there are some basic fundamentals of A-B testing that you know, anyone should take into consideration. So how many people in this room are a uh, run or own an online blog or magazine? Who publishes content, basically? How many people here are responsible for publishing content? Great, so most people. How many people in this room are the developers or designers behind that? Oh, almost the same people, that's awesome. <laughs> Hybrids are the best, right? I'm a hybrid myself, I do pretty much everything. If I could run on solar power, that'd be great. <laughs> uh, awesome, cool. So this is a good presentation that I think for all you guys. Um, so basically, anything you do, anything you do, you can apply these principles to, and it's really good to understand the principles before you start using the tools, right? Because there's different tools for different principles. And the one thing I can say, and I know, look, marketing, advertising, in general is a whole lot of bullshit. That's true, I know. I ran a marketing agency for three years and I charged clients a whole lot of money for a whole lot of maybes, right? It's not that we didn't produce, we did. It's not that we, didn't, we weren't successful for our clients. It's not that we didn't get them more business or more hype or more this or more that, but it's a really big like maybe. That's what marketing is, it's a huge gamble. Give me your money, right? And we're gonna take a gamble on these four things or three, these are the different things we're gonna do and then we're going to test and optimize whatever to figure out how we can get you more whatever it is, okay? That's the essentials behind marketing. And then advertising is really like, 
here's the glossy, I'm going to sell it to you. Here's the commercial, here's the ad, here's the whatever, right? That, that, that somehow congruent with that, that marketing campaign. Landing pages falling into though, or A-B testing in general, or conversion design in general, falls into marketing, of course. But the interesting thing about it is that it's really science-based. It's all math. It's numbers. It's data. And if you follow the steps and you follow the processes, you will be successful every single time. It's, it's, it's really a matter of spend the right amount of money on the right tests, test the right way, make sure you have your hypotheses in advance, you know what you're testing and how you're testing it, track those numbers and watch the data flow, make the appropriate changes, and you will be successful every time. Now that success can mean many different things. It could mean now we know this doesn't work, now we know this does work, now we know this does something, but maybe there's more we need to do. Right? So these are the basic fundamentals behind understanding oops, how that works. So I want to talk about the seven principles of conversion-centered design. Is everybody familiar with the term conversion-centered design? It's another, yeah, I know, CCD, LPO, CRO, this, that, all the rest. There's a billion acronyms. Um, in fact, I wanted to, just for fun on my business card, take all the acronyms and just stick them by my name. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like instead of a PhD, no, I'm a CCD, CRO, LPO. Like, well, well, what is that? Well, you know, give me your money and I'll show you. <laughs> but uh, basically, it's just another, it's another acronym. It means conversion-centered design. It's the new trend right now, but essentially what it means is designing for more conversions, right? So, I don't know, everything from changing the copy to the color to the placement to the size of a button, of a graphic, of a piece of text, whatever. This is conversion-centered design. What we do at Daychamp, Daychamp is the new company uh, I started, I call it a, it's not, I mean, it's really a design studio to me and uh, my partner. Uh, and what we do is, is this exact thing. We started off just doing landing pages, but now we design anything for more conversions. And, and these are the basic principles. Ollie Gardner is one of the founders of Unbounce, and Dan McGraw's one of the, not founders, but he's like this, not the CEO, but he's pretty high up at Kissmetrics, and he's been there almost since the beginning. These two guys and these two companies, in fact, are, are known in that industry. So when it comes to, uh, certain types of marketing, specifically landing page optimization, conversion rate optimization, this kind of marketing, these guys are fairly well-known figures, right? So these, if this was the world of WordPress, you know, you'd know who these people were. And they kind of came up with these seven principles that people are still using uh, today. And I'm just going to quickly go through these principles because they're super important. So number one is attention ratio. And basically, this is about uh, focusing the user's attention on one thing and one thing only. The key thing with a landing page, when we're talking about landing pages, right, is that when somebody lands there, so I'm, I'm on Facebook. No, let's say I'm just Googling. Let's say I need to buy, I don't know, let's say I need to buy a new pair of shoes and I want a certain kind of shoe and I go to Google and I'm like, I don't know, funky airwalks or something like that, right? I'm looking for something in particular. And I'll get a bunch of ads that pop up because of that, right? On the side, above, and then of course, high ranked pages. Chances are 90%, if not more, 99% of the stuff that I see right away, all right off the bat, above the fold, are all gonna take me to landing pages. I'm gonna click on one of those things, and if they're doing it right, it's gonna throw me to this page where I see like a nice picture of a shoe. Hey, this shoe is the best fucking shoe you've ever seen, and now you wanna get it starting at this price. Buy it now, also get a free pair of laces, click here. Right, that's essentially a landing page. And the one thing you'll notice about that is they try to focus your attention on the one thing, which is look how awesome this shoe is and why you want this shoe. No menus, right? No, no, no social links, nothing that's what we call in this industry leakage. Nothing that's gonna take you away from the one thing we want you to do, which is buy or sign up or download or whatever that one ROI is for that particular campaign. So this is super important that when the user, I keep hitting the wrong button, when the user lands there, that you, you drive all their focus to one place. You also want to make sure that your ad design and the message are consistent. So again, I'm looking for these shoes. The ad that I see, let's say I'm on Facebook, the picture of the shoe that I see, the, the copy that goes with that, those should be the first things I see when I land on the landing page. I shouldn't land on a page that says something completely different. Right, which is like, I don't know, Oakley sandals. It's not what I was looking for, right? This is a company that didn't get it. So they sell obviously all kinds of shoes and they're just using ads to drive you to a page to market you or sell you something. It doesn't work. 
psychologically, this has been tested, right? User group tested, action tested, you know, and we've seen it in the numbers every single time that the conversion coupling isn't there and we can't match message, add message with where user ends up. It doesn't work. And this can be applied for anything, right? This is even, you know, you have a case study, a white paper, a blog post, whatever it is that you're trying to drive traffic to. When you put that out there on social networks or paid advertising, ad displays, whatever, even verbally, right? Make sure what you put out there is what they're going to see when they come. Otherwise, there's a disconnect. And disconnect always leads to a drop off in conversions. Uh, same goes with number three, which is contextual design. So the look and feel of this also needs to make sense. There needs to be an underlying narrative, a story that's being told, right? Everything needs to come together. There's a value proposition, right? Which is, boom, I love these shoes, et cetera, et cetera. What's the story? Maybe a really great video, right? Of some guy like, oh yeah, man, when I walk on these shoes, it's like walking on clouds. Or maybe he's like on a longboard in California with the palm trees behind him in the waves, right? There's a story being told so that when you see that Apple does this really well, a lot of companies do, Nike does this really well, they put you into this feeling where you're like, I want to be him or her or whatever it is. I want to be in that scene. I want to be in that place. I want to be, this is what I want. This makes sense to me. Right demographic, right product, right story. I'm already hooked, right? Congruent design. So, you know, similar to the idea of conversion coupling or telling a good story, but this is, also, this is about ensuring that every element we put on that page is congruent too. So it's not just about having pictures of shoes or whatever. It's making sure that every image on there makes sense. Don't throw a stock image somewhere on the page because you had, an em you had empty white space and you didn't know what to do with it. Make sure that every single element, every copy, every button, right, every design, every color, everything makes sense and works together. They come together uniformly and tell the same story so that there's no disconnect, right? So you don't want moving from panel to panel going, oh yeah, yeah, well, this panel stands out all of a sudden, I don't know, I'm confused. Now I don't know what they're telling me. Maybe they threw another product in. You know what I really hate? Is if I'm looking, maybe, maybe you guys feel the same way, is if I click on an ad to buy a product and I see a price, but then I get there and then I see seven different prices. It's like, what the, f seriously? You said $3.99, now I'm seeing 20 different things. I'm done, I'm gone, I'm clicking somewhere else because I'm looking for something very specific. Believe it or not, this is how it works. Conversions will always, I've tested it on many, many pages. Put one price, more people will sign up. Put six prices, less people start signing up. It, it's, it's guaranteed to happen. Well, most of the time. Uh, clarity. Um, I mean, we're already talking about this anyways, but basically dead simple. Make it so that people understand exactly what it is you're saying. What are you selling? What's the service? What's the product? You know, what's the message behind this blog post, this article, this case study? Whatever it is, make sure it's simple and clear so that when people land there, they get it. There's no confusion. Everything makes sense. And then they're gonna do what you want them to do. Credibility. This is super important. Maybe one of the most important things today is people need to know that they can trust, right? You, trust the brand, trust the, the company, trust whatever it is, the service, the organization. And we do this with things like testimonials, uh, with social proof. There's a lot of ways to build trust. I know you, you, you probably, you know, it's, it's funny because there have been many good studies that show that a lot of people uh, when asked about testimonials on a landing page, let me ask you, let's do this right now. How many people in this room, when you get to a website of some kind, whether it be a product page or whatever it is, uh, a landing page of some kind, you land somewhere on the internet for a product, a service, et cetera, you see testimonials, how many of you believe those are valid? Those are real, those are legit testimonials. Put your hands up if you think they're real. Very few people. And this is an interesting thing, yet, Yet, right, studies show even though people, and this is true, most people don't believe they're legit, it still somehow psychologically makes people do it anyways. Even though they're saying, oh, it's not real, I still want this. <laughs> it still seems to work for some reason, the testimonial works. Here's what I can tell you, okay, uh, from my experiences anyways. They're real, usually. I mean, I've not, not my, my clients, but I'm not saying that because I'm standing up here. I'd tell you if I'd lie. I lie all the time on the internet. I'm not gonna lie about that. 
right? But I always say to my clients, look, get me some testimonials. Get something. Find some, anything. You've got it. If you're selling a product or a service, you have that information at your fingertip. Go find it. Bring it back to me, and we'll stick it on there. And we'll figure out a way to use it. And then finally, conversion continuance. This would be obviously the most important. Well, I shouldn't say obviously, but seven for a reason, because this is the, you know, the old school concept of like always be closing, right? Always be converting, right? So it's, the, it's, you know, it's not done there. You're never finished, right? So once, they've, once you've converted somebody on a landing page, on a product page, on an email, on a blog post or whatever, Find ways to continue to convert them for more things. Hey, sign up for this newsletter now. Send them to another page for another product. How many, this is really popular right now. It works really well in America. Um, I see it working all the time. We have a lot of clients, especially people in, let me ask the women, or I guess maybe men too. How many people in here purchase um, makeup or skin creams or that kind of stuff online? A uh, handful. Okay, well it's very popular in the US, people do. And this is not the US, but interesting thing is they have this process they use there, it's called a step one, step two page, right? Where you see these pages, like get this cream, get a free bottle now, and also get this one, step one, step two. They make you do two things to get two free trial products. It's very popular and it works, it converts a lot of people. We've seen a lot of success with this with the people that we've worked with. <coughs> So it's just, a, it's another new trend. Okay, but we're still not ready to test yet. Now we understand what we need to do, how we need to do it, but there's still a few more things before we can get started. So, enter a cheesy joke. Do I, should, I have, should I play that again? Make sure we're on the same page. Are you ready for what's next? Okay, that's the CTA. Call to action, right? So the key in anything you do online is coming up with a good call to action. It's also the thing that we spend the most time testing is that call to action. So what, what is the call to action we're going to use? It's the trigger that makes somebody convert. It's the, it's the thing that will make them download, sign up, buy, play the video, whatever it is you want them to do. A strong CTA or CTAs is what's going to do that. So Let's talk real quickly about some CTA designs. So good, good CTA design should consist of a few things. They should be short and sweet, right? Because again, back to the seven principles, it needs to be clear, needs to be simple, needs to be fast. Get them hooked now, right? right? It needs to describe exactly what will happen when you click. So it's not submit or buy now or register or sign up. No, it's like, save my spot, get my free proposal now. You've seen these things, you've seen more and more of it. Psychological, it works. It's how we connect with our users online. We're telling them exactly what they're doing, right? So example, call to action, there's our button. Call to action with the supporting statement. So you'll see this quite often too, where just below it, so you know, save my seat, limited number, right? or you know, only five days left, uh, first 100 people, 10% discount, et cetera. Some kind of supportive statement. And sometimes you can put the supportive statement inside the call to action. I'm showing you these because these are different ways you can test to see what works and what doesn't. And then to see it in, exam in, in a, oops, and then to see it in the, wah, wah, wah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Tell me about it, because the stupid network won't let me use my phone with this because the IPs don't match up and normally I can just... <laughs> Toronto. 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 The T dot. Um, so if this was a workshop of some kind, this works really well. Save my spot. There are a limited number, there are a limited number of seats, right? So this is a, a CTA in action, call to action, my supportive statement, boom, test it. Now we can test the color, test the copy, test the placement, etc. Okay, so now let's talk about the placement of this. So, the fold. It always somehow manages, even in 2015, it still comes up in conversation. The fold. Okay, so how many people in this room don't believe in the fold? It's okay, put your hand up, man, if you don't believe. Put your hand up if you think the fold is bullshit. 
that it doesn't matter. Okay, first of all, how many people know what the fold is? Okay, for those of you who don't know, the fold, right, is the part of the screen, right, where everything's, you can't see below. So the fold is like everything you can see, the top half of the screen. The first thing you see is the fold. And it comes from old advertising from when brochures would fold, right? So it's the first fold of the advertisement. You can't see the rest until you open it up. You can't see the rest until you scroll. So that's the fold. Okay, how many people think the fold is bullshit? It doesn't matter that everything important is in the fold. Put your hand up if you think it's bullshit. Are you talking mobile? We're talking mobile, desktop, doesn't matter. Okay, how many people believe that the fold is legit? Notice I kept my hand up for both. <laughs> because it is and it isn't. Because the, what, this is the beauty of A-B testing, is that sometimes the fold is bullshit. For certain services, for certain cells, the fold doesn't work. Because you need to tell a fuller, more complete story. You need the user to scroll. You need to give them a way. Your value proposition has to be so strong that they want to continue to read. And certain products require that. They need to learn more. They're not just going to come and, and read a headline, re three bullet points, and then give you an email. That's not always going to happen. It'd be great, but it's not always going to happen. Sometimes you need to do more. So call to actions can be placed above the fold. And when we do this, we call this the five point punch. I'm going to show you an example of that. Or below the fold. And when they're below the fold, we call this a page narrative. So here's an example of the five point punch. One, descriptive headline. Two, supportive subheadline. Three, we have our brief statement that describes whatever the benefits or the services. Then we have our supportive bullet points below that. Number four is our supportive statement, and five is our call to action. All this above the fold is called the five-point punch. This is landing page design 101. It's been done for four or five years now since landing pages have been out, and 99% of the time is successful. And here is an example of it in, I don't know, the cucumber water is weird. I feel like I should be chewing, <laughs> but I'm not like, drinking the cucumber. I don't know. It's weird. <clears throat> Sorry, it's just, it's just weird. Uh, so the five-point punch in action, this was for a client in the US, a security company, and it was a download for white paper, right? So all the relevant information right up front, okay? Five-point punch above the fold, right? And sometimes I will test this against, a five, uh, against the page narrative to see if this works. I'll do one version like this, and then maybe I'll do one version where I take you know, this form away, you know, maybe make this bigger, take away the bullet points, and just have like some copy, picture, button, click on the button, it takes you lower down, right? So there's different ways we can test it. And, and you want to take a picture of that? I saw you had your camera up. Do you want me to go back? Yeah. You got it? Oh, someone else want me to go back? Yeah, yeah. yeah. There you go. It's already online. Uh, Tom, where's Tom? Where, where can they get it? Okay, if you go to SlideShare and you search Digibomb, you'll already see it. <clears throat> okay, but it doesn't always work. As I said, sometimes you need more. You need to tell a compelling story. There needs to be a narrative to achieve that goal. So here's an example of a page narrative, right? Where we tell a longer story. So we're not using a five-point punch, right? So this is, an, this is an example where we have what we call panels. So you have multiple panels, okay? And throughout here, we drive, them, we drive them to what we want them to do by putting strategically placing buttons all throughout there and copy all throughout there. So we have our top <coughs> panel, which we call the hero. The first panel's always called the hero. Value prop, sub uh, information, also logo, phone number. And then get more speed now, right? So we talked about that. Tell them what they're getting. They're signing up for faster internet. Get more speed now, benefits, you know, services, a little whatever, blah, 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 call to action in the middle, a little statement here, right? And then here's the actual form that they fill in. So we go, we go through the hero, the benefits, uh, what we call a lower CTA, so having another CTA further down, the trust building, and then our final call to action, which in this case is the form at the bottom. So this is our page narrative. This is a long form version, right, that sometimes works better than the five point punch. And then you test this differently. Put the you can put the form in the hero and see what happens. <coughs> but hold your horses. We're still not quite ready to test yet. 
so much cheesier when you actually say it. <clears throat> okay, so before, I, I love the Muppets. In fact, normally I usually have Muppets throughout my entire presentation. In this one, there's only two, two pictures. But these guys are my favorite, especially Beaker. I love Beaker. Um, if I had to choose a Muppet, he'd be my Muppet. I'll have some more cucumber water. <laughs> yeah, flipped upside down. Um, so now it's time to to now it's time to form some testable hypotheses, right? So it's great to say, okay, here's what we're gonna do: five point punch or long form, whatever. But now we need to know before we do this, what are we testing exactly? What are the different things we want to test? And we come up with those tests in different ways. So what can we test for starters? We can test headline copy, so a different value proposition. We can test the call to action design and the button copy, the size of the button, the look and feel of the button, the color of the button, uppercase, lowercase, the copy that's on there, right? Get more speed, get more speed now, right? Uh, sign me up for more speed, right? I mean, there's different ways you can say the same thing to see which one resonates better with people when they come to the landing page. And then the form length and design. This is a key one here, is playing around with how the form, especially in the scenario where you need people to fill out information, this is always going to be an area to test. We do a lot of uh, conversion design for, for e-com companies, and we do a lot of stuff. They, a lot of people come to us just to have us help them better design their forms. We're not even doing their landing pages. It could even be enrollments for online applications or memberships or whatever, and we help people better design how the, form, how the form is laid out, multi-step multi forms versus one large form, what fields we use, the colors, the copy that we put in there, and we'll do A-B tests on all that. We even do that with, um, on shopping carts, we'll do the whole funnel, right? From product through the whole purchasing thing, we'll optimize and redesign everything and test six different things to see what works better, right? Get more sales, upsells, whatever it is. Uh, page length is another good one, two panels, three panels. Let's test with the benefits panel, let's test without a benefits panel. Let's test the benefits panel that's just, you know, bullet point, uh, sorry, that's just like, uh, you know, the name of the service in an icon or name of service with three bullet points or name of service with a sentence. Do people want to read the sentence? Do they just want to look at the bullet points or do they just care about the headline? What works best? What, what resonates with people, et cetera? How do we, uh, sorry, how do we decide what to test? It's, so, I mean, there's a lot of different ways. Obviously, a lot of the times clients will come to us, they don't have this data, especially if they're just starting out. Um, so in that case, we have to go blind. We need to get data in order to start asking questions so that we know what to test. But most of the time, people have something, right? So, you know, if you've already got people reading your blog or signed up to your newsletter, or you've already got a handful of customers or whatever it is you're doing, ask them. Even if you don't know these people, it doesn't matter. It's amazing how open people will be if you send them an email or you give them a phone call and say, hey, we're just curious, what was it that made you buy my product? What was it that you, what, what was it that you liked about the web page? What don't you like? Even though you bought the product, would there be anything you would have changed? Was the experience good for you? Was it too short, right? Was it not, was it not short, uh, fa uh, long enough? Did you need more even though you ask people, get survey, get feedback. You know, it's amazing, but people will do this. And I always get my clients, sometimes I'll help them. I'll compose the email and show them how to do it or whatever. And we'll collect information from their current base of whatevers, right? And then we use that to start testing against. And what do we test? We have to formulate those hypotheses. So, for example, uh, to perform an A-B test, we need at least 100 plus unique visits. Right? For a multivariant test, we need at least 10 times that. So basically what that means is if I don't have enough traffic, there's no point in doing certain kinds of tests. Right? If you're not getting enough traffic to whatever it is you want to test, then an A-B test is not going to work because the way an A-B test works is we make two copies of something, right? which means math using a basic piece of code or if you're using unbounce or whatever it is, I'm dividing traffic. I'm saying 50% is going to see this, 50% is going to see that. Or I change my sample size. 30% is going to see this. 70, it'll be this way. 70% is going to see this. 30% is going to see this, et cetera. But if I don't have enough traffic, splitting 10 people in half or by 30% doesn't make any sense. And for an MVT, which means multivariant test, so that's not A versus B, that's A versus B versus C versus, and we do that. Sometimes we'll have six versions that we're testing. Because if I have a client that's got like, you know, 10, 15, 
whatever, 20,000 uniques that are coming, I can say, okay, let's test these five things right off the bat. Let's split the traffic right across and see what happens, right? So examples of some stuff that we've done. This was a, a client of mine in Korea selling um, red ginseng. By the way, so they're, they're not a client of mine anymore. <clears throat> not for bad reasons, they're just not. Uh, it was just easier for them to find somebody in Korea for some of the stuff that they were going to be doing next. But I happen to still use this ginseng. It's great. <laughs> I, just, I wanted to say, because uh, I'm not a believer in this. These guys made me a believer. It's interesting. I actually sold myself on my own copy. Anyways, um, the hypothesis here, it's true, man. The hypothesis here was this. Um, if we added supportive bullet points below the headline, right, the number of click-throughs would increase. So we tested two versions. With Origin, you get 100% Korean red ginseng in the convenience of a tablet by Origin Now. 100% da da da, no additives, no fillers, six year roots cultivated, eight times more, whatever, by Origin Now, right? So that, that was the test. And 28% more people signed, clicked the button when we added the bullet points. So we had a 28% lift. Can we wait till, till the end for questions? Do you mind? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, again, just about design, but thinking about some of those little things, what's important, what stuff do you want to highlight, not highlight? So if we look back at the seven principles, right, that would be one of them. So you can try underlining, not under, try a different color and see what happens too. Here's an interesting one, by the way, that seems to work. Um, for whatever reason, psychologically, orange buttons work the best on the internet. So if you have an orange button, chances are you're going to do better. I don't know why. Nobody knows why. People in this industry don't know why. Um, but it, it tends to always work better. Uh, Mr. Crate, this was a business in a box. So this guy came to me and he was validating a concept. Business didn't exist yet. All he wanted to do was say, this is what the business is going to be. Men's clothes curated, this whole experience about a personal shopper to find you clothing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and he was testing whether or not people would be interested. So it was all about a sign up to, know, to be notified of when we launched. So if there was enough interest, he was going to build the business. So in this example here, we tested two headlines, right? And the hypothesis was that the secondary headline was more emotional, more personal, right? And that we felt that that statement, right, would, would essentially gain us more conversions. So we had a control. So our control is the main one. That's our A. That's the initial, what is our page? So our control was an online personalized shopping experience delivered straight to your door. The conversion rate, 4.82%. It's okay. Variant one, your wardrobe handpicked by your personal stylist delivered to your door. We had 130% lift just on that, right? So that means more than double, right, of the people who came to the site now started clicking on this. These are actually old numbers. I should have updated this since. But anyways, we just kept optimizing and optimizing. Since then, we changed the header images and this and that, and that worked better. And then another potential variant was just more blunt. Men's clothing and accessories curated. This actually, again, numbers are not here. This actually did very well, but still not as well as this. Let's keep all questions to the end, just because I want to get through some of this stuff. So write it down, and I'll, I'll gladly answer anything. This is how I, I set up the tests when I run them, right? So I will control variant one, variant two. CTA, in this case, this is the CTA copy I want to test. By origin now, by origin, get origin. What's my conversion rate? What's my, what's my conversion left? There was a really great question raised when we were doing this uh, by somebody I was working with on the acquisition team. And she said, why, why are we saying by origin now? Shouldn't it say by ginseng? I said, well, Will, think about it. What are you buying? Yes, you're buying ginseng, but you're buying origin. And part of the ROI of this campaign is brand awareness. So if I went to Nike's website, do I want to click on the button that says buy shoe? <laughs> right? Or buy the name of whatever that product is? So yes, it's a valid uh, question, but it's all psychological. We tested. It didn't work. Just saying. I was right. <laughs> this was a really interesting one for a very fancy Medi Spa in Montreal. Um, cool sculpting. Anyone know what cool sculpting is? They blow cold air in your fat and it disappears. I tried it. Yeah. <laughs> but I got them a lot of people. <laughs> so we tried three different versions. Form and header, 
uh, click to, to a form, so a long page narrative, and then a form and a modal. And these were the basic percentage lifts on each one of those tests. So we ran three tests to see what worked better. I hope you didn't go with that spelling error. Oh, sh where is there a spelling error? I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> All right, what else can we test? Incentives, exclusives, upsells, downsells, cross sells, free trial versus freemium, behind the scenes, competitor comparisons, testimonials, social proof, trusted by, uh, coupons, ratings, first person versus second person copy, urgency. There's so many different things that we can test to see what works best. So we lay out what our KPIs are, we lay out what, it, what the return that we want on this, and then we test, test, test with our hypotheses. Okay, so finally, in, when it comes to the world of WordPress, right, you can apply these principles to the, any of these things. So in landing pages, email, product pages, app pages, pricing pages, contact pages, etc. So there are a few different plugins that will enable us to do that. These are some of the more popular ones. Uh, Unbounce and Optimizely are third party, but there's plugins. Same with Visual Web Optimizer. Convert Experience by Yoast is super cool. So if you're already using Yoast, this will allow you to plug in and test things like post headline. You can test widgets. You can test a lot of really cool things. Ultimate Landing Page Tool actually allows you to create landing pages in WordPress. And then WBounce is an exit overlay. So you know when you go to exit a site, a window pops up. Hey, hold on a minute. Blah, 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 blah. It's, a, it's one of those plugins, so it's very cool. Uh, just recently, this was the big news for Unbounce anyways, and I think for the WordPress community, those of us who are marketers, uh, is that now you can publish Unbounce landing pages in one click directly to, to WordPress. So if you have an Unbounce account and you install the Unbounce plugin inside of WordPress, I can literally create a landing page, click a button, and once I've set it all up, which is like four or five screens, it's super easy, no code, it will literally take that landing page and stick it right inside my WordPress site. It's awesome, and it's great, especially for those of you who've done this before, and you know you have WordPress, and you have all these other landing pages. Now you can combine it all, and it's super cool. We're almost at questions, guys, almost at questions. This is what the Optimizely thing does. So it allows you to test A-B, so it's A-B testing for headlines. So it's really cool inside the dashboard. It allows you to actually say, okay, headline one, headline two, and then you can test which headlines do better. So what makes people read the post or stay longer on the post or comment on the post, et cetera. Uh, this is for page variants in Optimizely. So it actually lets you test different entire page designs. This is the convert by Yoast, so it does a similar thing. Gives you a toolbar at the top that allows you to A-B test various different things on the page, including widgets, which I love. This is Nelio. It's, it's premium. You need to pay, but you get a ton of awesome tools uh, with this. Most importantly is heat mapping. Heat mapping is probably one of the most essential tools in your CRO arsenal. Heat mapping will tell you so much about what people are doing and how they're engaging and interacting with your content and will give you tons of data that you can use to test and get higher conversions. And people I know who are using heat mapping are, are, are very successful with their experiments. Uh, this is the ultimate landing page tool. It's okay. You can play with it. And this is the W bounce, so the, the exit window that you get. So basically what it is is no code required. This is a pretty cool one. You can if you want to, or you can just put an image in there. It's a cool plugin for WordPress. And uh, basically, the minute someone's cursor leaves the actual, so if it, it goes onto anything in the browser bars, this window will pop up. So if someone's leaving your page, this will pop up and say, hey, wait a minute. You know, before you go, maybe you want this. Or we do, but we also hate it. It's, it's, it's a love-hate relationship. And then, of course, there are a ton of other landing page options. So if you want to do it third party, Unbounce, Lead Pages, Lander, Instapage, HubSpot, Marketo, PageWiz, there's tons of them. Obviously, I'm going to promote Unbounce because I'm a partner and because they have a plugin. Uh, but Lander is super cool. It's the only one on the market that just like the direct publish to, to WordPress that Unbounce does, these guys direct publish to Facebook. It is so freaking cool with the pro account. I get my landing page. Click Facebook button and it sticks the landing page right on Facebook. That is a marketer's wet dream for those of you who are marketers. <laughs> it's freaking amazing. So trust me on that one. You might want to try it if you're doing a lot of Facebook uh, advertising. And then some really great third-party tools. Crazy Egg is a heat mapping tool. Kissmetrics has a ton of different tools that you can use. Uh, it's also a marketing platform. 
Rooster is really cool, recently purchased by Unbounce, but still running on its own. And these guys are also, these are exit. It's all about retention, so it's all exiting and over, uh, exit overlays. Uh, Wistia is super cool. This is a conversion tracking tool for videos. So it allows you to track everything people do with the videos that you have, how long are they playing, playing them for? When did they click pause? When did they click play? Did they go full screen or not go full screen? Did they take pictures? Did they, it's super, super cool. And then finally, Receiptful is really neat. This is Addy Wu, by the way. Addy Wu, Addy Rockstar, the guy who was the original founder of Wu Themes. This is his new project because you know he sold the company long before WordPress bought it. But uh, Receiptful is very cool, and it's an upselling uh, tracking tool for e-com. It allows you to do all, coin, all sort, sorts of cool things inside of receipts and invoices to convert and get people, get better retention, get people to sign up, sell more products, whatever. So if you're doing any e-com, check out Receiptful. Super, super cool tool. And that's it. Be patient and keep optimizing. Mr. Sorry? Uh, Mr. Crate. Uh, oh, Mr. Crate, yeah. Uh, because there was no business there, right? So there was no audience. So I'm guessing, I'm just uh, wondering how you came up with the audience and how did you get it? Okay. So there's two questions. I'll answer the first one, which is the um, SEO. SEO has absolutely nothing to do with it. In fact, SEO is dead. Don't waste your time. SEO is just like responsive in the sense that it's inherited. If you're not already doing it, if it's not already a part of what, you know, you're building or putting online, you're already making a huge mistake. SEO is long-term organic traffic. It requires a ton of patience and is not meant for, for this kind of online campaign. Today, you want to sell something online, you want more traffic, you want more users, you want more signups, you pay for that. You pay for eyeballs. PPC, ad display is what is the way to go. Spend a few hundred dollars, spend a few thousand dollars, whatever it is, every month, right, on PPC, drive that traffic, optimize your landing page, test the data, and keep doing that until you get more and more conversions, and then you drive your, your click through, uh, your pay-per-click down. That's the whole point, right? So higher CPAs, lower CTRs. It's, it's the holy trinity of conversion rate optimization. PPC, conversion center design, optimization, and you just keep doing it over and over and over again until you're a millionaire. And then the Mr. Crate thing was, uh, there was no audience. We had to build it. It was an idea. It was a concept. So same deal. We bought traffic. So we st strategically you know, bought the right keywords on Facebook, on Google. We ran ads. We drove traffic. And then we slowly optimized to see if it worked. How much did you spend on that? Mr. Crate? It wasn't a success, by the way. I mean, it was a success in terms of we got people, but he didn't get enough to make a business out of it. Um, but we were spending a few thousand. We spent about three or $4,000 yeah, on Facebook ads. There was a question in the, in the way back, right? No? Nope. Okay. It has nothing to do with Google, right? So landing pages typically sh are short-term anyways, three-month campaigns, one-month campaign. They shouldn't really run forever, per se. Uh, so you shouldn't be indexing them because you're not driving traffic to landing pages and again, in that traditional SEO sense, it's not about what I'm going to give a crap about Google when I build these pages. I break all the rules because I'm paying for traffic, right? So what I'm doing is ensuring that nothing's being indexed, right? And everybody who's coming to the landing page has come there because they clicked on one of my ads. That's what I'm tracking. However, there are still certain rules that apply for certain platforms. If I put a Facebook ad, the page needs to comply to certain Facebook things or they'll take my ad off of Facebook. How many more questions do I have? Uh, can you keep going? And I have a special one now. So okay. Forms. So the actual forms, the A-B tested forms? Yes. Order. Everything. How do you do that? We, we make multiple forms. So we test what works better, right? Two fields, three fields, first name, last name, just a name, uh, multi-step, drop downs, check boxes. Uh, color of the button, where the button is, how long, how short, encapsulated, right? It's always better, in fact, I should have mentioned that in there, it's always better when you have a form to make sure it's encapsulated so that it's highlighted, that there's a border around it or it sticks out, it stands out. Throw an orange button in there, see what happens, I don't know, right? There's a million different tests, basically. Uh, seen tons of success with multi-step and pop-up. So click on a button, thing pops up, asks you a question, you fill it in, click next, fill it in, click next, submit, done. Those tend to work very, very well. 
doesn't, doesn't matter. So again, this is one of those old SEO things, which is true at one I time. SEO, I, I just mean that, like, for instance, if you're using an unbalanced and you're creating a bunch of yeah. variances, yeah. does it matter? Oh, sorry, you sorry. Like you know what? It really doesn't look. People will tell you from a marketing or branding perspective that the URL should mean something. And I don't disagree per se, but at the same time I could care less because again, they're clicking on an ad and they're going there and there's going to be UTM code in there anyway. So it's just going to be a long, googly, crappy, freaking URL anyways, right? But in terms of the unbound side, because you asked specifically about unbound, it's, it's mirrored. So they're just making multiple copies of the same page. So it doesn't really matter. It's just the code that spits out different versions of that page. Can you view those different versions independently? Yes, there's a way to do that as the developer. So when you create the page in Unbounce, yeah. when you use the plugin, is it, does the page same deal. It lives in Unbounce or does it actually go into your WordPress? Lives in Unbounce, but it renders out through your WordPress. I see. So it's not in your WordPress navigation. No, but the, you, don't, you can do it all once it's all set up. You can view and see everything from within WordPress, which makes it you know one less thing to log into essentially, right? Yeah. So heat mapping, uh, it's a heat map of all movement on the page where the cursor goes. Yeah. What people click on, all that kind of stuff. What they maybe copied, uh, screenshots, stuff like that. You mentioned uh, Holy Trinity of three different things: paper yeah. clicks, CPRs. Yeah. Through. So the, the holy trinity of conversion rate optimization, CRO, right? So the holy trinity is PPC, conversion center design, optimization. And then we just keep doing that over and over and over again okay. until we make a million dollars. <laughs> Our first move. So you were talking about statistical significance earlier, like you know, 100 plus users. So you're not just form, and you said I'll test it, but you could do it like 12 things. So you're going to test like 12 elements no. of form, no? Not at the same time, no. Yeah, so you want to you want to test Sorry, this is the last question. Oh, okay. You want to test slowly, right? Uh, especially if you don't have a ton of traffic. So what you want to do is say, okay, we're going to test these two variances of the form for I don't know, a few days or whatever. Then we're going to change one thing. So if one's doing better than the other, we call that the champion. We move that one up, we drop this out, we test it against something else. If this one wins, then now the champion's no longer the champion. This one becomes the champion. We throw in another variant. If we have enough traffic, we can test three or four different things and see what happens. But when you're doing your testing, unless it's an MVT where you're like, I want to test a whole new design, design A versus design B, which you got to be super careful about. You can kill your traffic very quickly. Um, typically, you want to make small changes to your tests. You don't want to have a, a completely different page that you're testing because then you don't know what worked and what didn't work, right? Yeah. So, and um, when you're capturing data, is there specific things that are unsuccessful? Like, so if, if I want to capture a form that captures like an address, that's usually, I would imagine, has less success than just capturing an email. Yeah. Well, and, and this is the funny thing. That depends, really. It really depends on the service. It depends on what it is. Yes, typically you find it's more difficult to get things like addresses out of people or phone numbers out of people, but you'd be surprised where in certain industries it works. Like, for example, any one of the, every time I've done a landing page for a doctor, a lawyer, an accountant, any kind of professional like that, people will give, like, <laughs> If they don't know you, they will give you everything. It's amazing. It's like, oh, he's a doctor. He's a lawyer. Here, take it all, right? So it, it, really, it really depends. It really depends. You know, if I'm selling my, my Airwalks, you unless you've bought it and your shipping address, chances are no. Yeah, I guess if you build in value add as well, because they could also, for example, something else you need to address the energy. So this is ways, so there's ways you can get around. So this is exactly. So you know, people get through the whole thing, and then that's why multi-step forms work because we know that that's a potential for drop-off. Oh, the address, are they going to give it to us? I don't know. Let's see what happens on step three. They get to the address. All of a sudden, we have conversion drop-off. They start to leave, but wait. Then the bounce window pops up. If you really want your free trial, and then we explain to them how it works, or we might put something like, call this number now and speak with the representative. Right? Build that trust. Keep them. Retain them. Figure out a way not to lose that conversion, right? That was principle number seven, which is the continuance, right? Yeah. In terms of ROI on PPC, what do you find works best? Is it AdWords? Is it Bing? Again, it's different for everyone. So the Korean one, it's interesting that you brought that up because with the Korean one, we found we got way better traction and conversions by using Bing, and we stopped using Google. It was cheaper, and we were getting more in that particular demographic of people for whatever reason 
we're using Bing over Google. That's rare, but it does happen. In terms of ad display uh, versus Facebook versus Twitter versus this, that, and all the rest, you got to test it. And is there a way to sell early on? Like yes, a good PPC company does all that for you. Most PPC, if you're, you're working with a legit PPC company, all that research, they will always do for free up front. They never charge you for that, right? Because most PPC companies charge you a setup fee and then they take a percentage. So they, by default, will uh, do all that research for you. So they'll, they'll do the keyword research and they'll tell you, hey, look, based on our research, it shows that most people buying this product are searching for it here and they're using these keywords. And we want to buy these keywords, they cost this much. So we're going to bid on these keywords with this budget over this period of time to start drop, to get our click-through rate up, right? but spend less per click, and then we'll optimize our page as we go along based on the conversions and traffic. Yeah. Exact same time. Yeah, so most people start right off the bat. 50%. So here's A, here's B. One headline versus a different headline. 50% of the traffic that gets there will see one, 50% will see the other. How does that work? It's totally random. No, so now what we're talking about is retargeting. So when we run retargeting ads, anybody who is coming back for a second time, they've already clicked on an ad, we've cached them, they're in a cookie or whatever. We, it's sneaky, but this is how we do it. So we run retargeting ads. We actually create something that's just a subtly, slightly different than what they first saw. And we test, maybe they needed more copy, maybe they needed less copy, maybe they needed a different design. And we retarget all those people, we try to get them to re-click, because these are all the people that abandoned the first time, and then we figure out if we can convert them the second time around. So how many people here ever worked when they were younger in a call center? Right? I did, in fact, I made a lot of money because I was really good at the, re the, re the people who rejected, right? So I was being given the lists of all the people who said no the first time, and I would call them all back and get them to do it. And I got five bucks per person. And I could easily make hundreds of dollars in an evening because I'm really good at getting people to do what I want. <laughs> Probably how I ended up in this industry, right? But it's the same basic principles. It hasn't gone away. We're just doing it online now. <laughs>